How is hypertension defined in pregnancy? Hypertension is defined in pregnancy if VP is more than 140 by 90 on two occasions four hours apart. Please remember if VP is more than 160 by 110, then you don't have to wait for four hours. Then you have to repeat VP in 15 minutes. Right, because in this case, you have to give her antihypertensives immediately. So, I'm not going to wait for four hours. A very common confusion which you all have is that both diastolic and systolic should be raised to call it as hypertension. No, either uh, systolic should be more than equal to 140 or diastolic should be equal to more than 90 or both should be more than 140 by 90. Similarly, for uh, BP, if, uh, severe hypertension, if it is BP, more than equal to 160 systolic more than equal to 160 or diastolic more than equal to 110 either of them then you are going to call it as severe hypertension right now when a hypertensive female conceives so coming to the types of hypertensive females which you can get during pregnancy so number one is if a hypertensive female conceives then that is what is called as chronic hypertension in pregnancy so the increase in BP will be seen in first trimester it will be seen from the first day of pregnancy and BP doesn't come back to normal within 12 weeks of of delivery right then if number two kind of this is what is called as chronic hypertension in pregnancy number two it could there could be a female who was not hyper, uh, hypertensive before pregnancy before pregnancy her bp was normal during pregnancy due to some placental pathology and that placental pathology i'll talk to you about just now her bp increases in pregnancy and the increase in uh, bp will be seen after 20 weeks of pregnancy and bp comes back to normal within 12 weeks of delivery right this is what is called as pregnancy induced hypertension so if the increase in bp is happening after 20 weeks it is happening due to some problem in the placenta and bp is coming back to normal within 12 weeks of delivery that is pregnancy induced hypertension now because in pregnancy induced hypertension the increase in BP is happening due to some placental problems. So, the best management of PIH is termination of pregnancy. Now, PIH can further be divided into uh, gestational hypertension or preeclampsia. Gestational hypertension means PIH without proteinuria and without end organ damage. Whereas, if either proteinuria or end organ damage are present in a case of PIH, then that will be called as preeclampsia. Now, what is end organ damage? End organ damage is if platelet count is less than 1 lakh, if liver enzymes are raised to 2 times their normal value, if serum creatinine is more than equal to 1.1 milligram percent, if there is pulmonary edema, if you are getting cerebral or retinal symptoms, then that is what is called as uh, end organ damage. Proteinuria is if there is excretion of proteins more than equal to 300 milligrams in 24 hours or if on dipstick you are getting more than equal to plus 1 or if serum protein is to creatinine ratio is more than equal to 0 0.3 right so if excretion of protein is more than equal to 300 milligrams percent if serum protein in, protein is to creatinine ratio is more than equal to 0 0.3 or if on dipstick you are getting more than equal to plus one then that is what is called as proteinuria please remember if they ask you what is the screening test for hypertension in pregnancy or PIH in pregnancy there will there are two screening tests number one you have to check the BP number two you have to go for proteinuria by dipstick so both these are screening tests and it should be done in all pregnant females and it should be done whenever a pregnant female is coming for antenatal checkup right so the screening test is in, uh, is BP measurement and the screening test is checking for proteinuria by dipstick method proteinuria is never normal during pregnancy if you are getting proteinuria then there has to be some problem during uh, pregnancy right now when you are measuring bp you have to remember that systolic bp is represented by kotakov sound 1 and diastolic bp is represented by kotakov sound 5 that is disappearance of sounds this is in pregnancy in a non pregnant female systolic is by kotakov sound 1 but diastolic is by kotakov sound 4 that is muffling of uh, the sounds right now there can be a case where there is a chronic hypertensive patient who suddenly at 20 weeks of pregnancy she develops uncontrollable bp or she develops proteinuria or signs of end organ damage then that is what is called as chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia so whenever there is high bp during pregnancy it could be a case of chronic hypertension it could be a case of gestational hypertension it could be a case of preeclampsia it could be a case of chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia out of all these diagnoses, the gestational hypertension diagnosis is a 
provisional diagnosis. If any time during pregnancy, BP of the patient becomes more than equal to 160 by 110. So either systolic BP becomes more than equal to 160 or diastolic becomes more than equal to 110. Then you are going to change the diagnosis of gestational hypertension to severe preeclampsia. Now, similarly, in all gestational hypertensive patients in whom the diagnosis I had made was of gestational uh, hypertension, after delivery, after 12 weeks, I'm going to check their BP. If their BP is increased, even after 12 weeks of pregnancy, that means this is a case of I'm going to revise the diagnosis to chronic hypertension during pregnancy. See, what could happen is that a patient didn't know that before pregnancy she had hypertension, right? And she's coming to me with high BP after 20 weeks of pregnancy. She For, for her first antenatal visit is after 20 weeks of pregnancy. So at 22 weeks of pregnancy, she came to me and her BP was high. She didn't have any proteinuria. She didn't have any end organ damage. So I made the diagnosis of gestational hypertension hypertension although actually she is a case of chronic hypertension and that is why in all patients of gestational hypertension after 12 weeks of delivery you should check the BP and if BP is still raised then you should revisit your diagnosis you should change your diagnosis on the discharge card to chronic hypertension in pregn of pregnancy. Now if uh, BP after 12 weeks is normal then instead of calling it as gestational hypertension I am going to call it as transient hypertension in pregnancy. So always gestational hypertension hypertension diagnosis is a provisional diagnosis. Now, in case of preeclampsia, they can be mild preeclampsia or they can be severe preeclampsia. Mild preeclampsia means BP is more than 140 by 90 but less than 160 by 110. Whereas severe preeclampsia means BP is more than equal to 160 by 110. Number two, in mild preeclampsia, you will never get signs of end organ damage. Whereas in case of severe preeclampsia, signs of end organ damage will be present. Number three, if if you are getting signs of impending eclampsia, that means it's a case of severe preeclampsia because in mild preeclampsia you will never get signs and symptoms of impending eclampsia. Please remember that a patient of severe preeclampsia can develop convulsions and that is what is called as eclampsia. So in a patient of severe preeclampsia there are certain signs and symptoms which tell you that your patient is about to throw convulsions and these are what are called as symptoms of impending eclampsia. So what are the symptoms of impending eclampsia? Epigastric pain plus minus nausea vomiting, headache which is not responding to to normal medications and visual disturbances. These are symptoms of impending eclampsia. A sign of impending eclampsia is clonus. If you are getting clonus, then that indicates that it is a sign of impending eclampsia. Right now, uh, in case of mild preeclampsia and in case of severe preeclampsia, how am I going to do the management? Please remember that eclampsia is a complication of severe preeclampsia, and HELP syndrome is also a complication of severe preeclampsia. Now, uh, in case whenever a patient comes to me with PIH, initially, whether it's mild preeclampsia or whether it is severe preeclampsia, I am going to admit them all because I am going to do their lab investigations and I am going to make sure that it is a case of mild preeclampsia or severe preeclampsia. If it is a case of mild preeclampsia, these days mild preeclampsia term is not used. The term which is used is preeclampsia without severe features. And for severe preeclampsia, the term which is used is preeclampsia with severe features. So if I am dealing with a case of preeclampsia without severe features, then I am going to discharge them and I am going to tell them to come for an antenatal visit twice weekly and I am going to tell them that they should get their home monitoring of BP done to, uh, twice a day. So twice a day they have to measure their BP. Now, in case of severe preeclampsia, you have to let them remain admitted. Antihypertensives are not absolutely indicated in mild preeclampsia. It is only NICE guidelines which say that if BP of the patient is more than equal to 150 by 100 and persistently it is more than equal to 150 by 100, then you should be giving antihypertensives. No other guidelines say that in mild preeclampsia, antihypertensives should be given. But in severe preeclampsia, definitely you have to give antihypertensives because otherwise there are increased chances of intracranial hemorrhage. Now, because in severe preeclampsia, there are chances of throwing convulsions. That is why in all patients of severe preeclampsia, to prevent preeclampsia, you will have to give magnesium sulfate. How do you do uh, monitoring? So, monitoring in case of mild preeclampsia, you are going to tell them to get their BP measured twice daily. So, twice daily they have to measure their BP. NST they have to do weekly and biophysical profile they have to do weekly or twice weekly. So, 
एन एस टी एंड बायोफिजिकल प्रोफाइल विल बी डन वीकली और ट्वाइस वीकली बोथ ऑफ दैम वीकली और ट्वाइस वीकली एंड यू आर और यू आर गोइंग टू डू अल्ट्रासाउंड फॉर ग्रोथ आफ्टर एवरी फोर वीक्स नाउ इन केस ऑफ सिवियर प्री एक्लैम्शिया दे आर एडमिटेड विद यू इन दी हॉस्पिटल यू आर गोइंग टू मेजर दर बी पी आफ्टर थर्टी मिनट्स आफ्टर एवरी थर्टी मिनट्स यूर इन आउटपुट चार्टिंग हैज टू बी डन आर्ली एंड यू हैव टू चेक दर प्रोटीन ओरिया आफ्टर एवरी फोर आवर्स प्लीज रिमेंबर इन केस ऑफ प्री एक्लैम्शिया देर इज नो रोल ऑफ एब्सोल्यूट बेड रेस्ट देर इज नो रोल ऑफ लो सॉल्ट डाइट एंड देर इज नो लो रोल ऑफ लो डोज एस्पेरेंस वंस प्री एक्लैम्शिया और हाई बी पी हैज डिवेलप देर इज नो रोल ऑफ एस्पेरन द रोल ऑफ aspirin is to prevent preeclampsia from happening similarly when we were talking about preterm labor the role of progesterone was only up till the contractions begin once the contractions begin then pre then progesterone is not a tocolytic right so progesterone you cannot give to uh, uh, you to decrease the contractions the role of progesterone was only to prevent preterm labor similarly over here the role of aspirin is to prevent pih once a patient has developed high bp then there is no role of aspirin now antihypertensives the indication as i told you according to nice guidelines if bp is persistently raised more than equal to 150 by 100 or even once if you are getting bp 160 by 110 so if you are getting bp 160 by 110 even by even once i means that you will have to check it again after 15 minutes so you got a bp 160 by 110 and you waited for 15 minutes and again you checked the bp and it was 160 by 110 you are going to give her antihypertensives because you are going to classify it as a case of preeclampsia with severe features now the drug of choice the antihypertensive of choice for severe preeclampsia or for hypertensive crisis is uh, according to Uh, according to williams new edition there is no drug of choice now now there are three first line drugs and these three first line drugs are iv labetalol iv hydrolyzine and oral nifedipine a drug which cannot be used in case of uh, hypertensive crisis is methyl dopa other drugs which can be given for uh, preeclampsia are verapamil nitroglycerin ni nimodipine nicardipine and ketanserin these are the list of drugs which the, the recent williams is saying that can be given to manage preeclampsia the drug of choice for refractory hypertension or the last drug which i am going to give is sodium nitroprusside because sodium nitroprusside can lead to cyanide poisoning now antihypertensives for chronic hypertension again there are three first line drugs you can either give oral labetalol or oral nifedipine or you can give oral methyl dopa hydrolyzine is not given for managing chronic hypertension the other drugs which can be given for managing chronic hypertension as per williams new edition is ccbs propranolol metoprolol and hydrochlorothiazide is ideas so williams is saying that diuretics can be used for managing uh, chronic hypertension in pregnancy they are not the first line drugs and they have if they are used they have to be used before 20 weeks of pregnancy so uh, antihypertensives which are absolutely contraindicated are ace inhibitors disoxide and angiotensin receptor blockers whether it is chronic hypertension whether it is preeclampsia these are absolutely contraindicated absolutely contraindicated for preeclampsia this is for preeclampsia amsia plus for chronic hypertension a drug which is absolutely contraindicated for preeclampsia or for pih is diuretics you should never give diuretics in a patient of preeclampsia or pih because in a patient of preeclampsia or pih there is hemo concentration and that is why you are never going to give diuretics normally in pregnancy there is hemo dilution but in a patient of preeclampsia there is hemo concentration right then a patient of severe preeclampsia can develop help syndrome and the criteria for diagnosing help syndrome is the tennessee's criteria according to the tennessee's criteria uh, you know h stands for hemolysis el for elevated liver enzymes and lp for low platelet count now in order to diagnose hemolysis out of the following four which i'm going to tell you any two should be present ldh should be two times the normal value or haptoglobins should be decreased how much decreased less than 25 mg per dl there has to be severe anemia which is unexplained we don't know the reason for that severe anemia severe bilirubin more than equal to 1.2 and peripheral blood smear bird cells or schistocytes on peripheral blood smear you get bird cells or schistocytes out of these four so if ldh levels are two times the normal value or decreased haptoglobin levels if you are getting severe anemia due to unexplained reasons serum bilirubin more than equal to 1.2 or on peripheral blood smear you are getting schistocytes or bird cells 
out of these four if any two are present then you say hemolysis is present you say elevated liver enzymes if they are more than two times the normal value and low platelet count that means less than 1 lakh now whenever you have a help syndrome management is immediate termination of pregnancy for by induction of labor if patient is less than 34 weeks pregnant then you have to give glucocorticoids and earlier it was said that you have to wait for 48 hours after giving glucocorticoids and then go for induction of labor but now it is said that if patient is less than 34 weeks you have to give corticosteroids you do not have to wait for 48 hours and immediately you have to go for induction of labor now, case 1, there is a primary who's come to you at 14 weeks, her BP is normal, urine albumin is negative. At 32 weeks, her BP is 140 by 90, urine albumin is normal. What is the next step? So, after 4 hours, I am going to repeat her BP. Right, and if they say that a primary has come to you at 16 weeks, her BP is 150 by 110. Now, because her diastolic BP has become 110, so she has come into the category of severe preeclampsia or severe hypertension. So, in that case, after 15 minutes, I will repeat the BP. Now, what is the definitive management of preeclampsia? Definitive management of preeclampsia or PIH is termination of pregnancy. In case of mild preeclampsia, termination of pregnancy should be done at 37 weeks. In case of severe preeclampsia, termination of pregnancy should be done at 34 weeks. So, all severe preeclampsia patients who are more than 34 weeks, you have to terminate. More than equal to 34 weeks, you will have to terminate their pregnancy. Now, in case of severe preeclampsia, if your patient is less than 34 weeks and your patient has fetal distress, abruptio or DIC, there is impending eclampsia, eclampsia, HELP syndrome or severe uncontrollable hypertension. In these conditions, which are emergency conditions, in these conditions, even if the pregnancy is less than 34 weeks, you are going to give the first dose of corticosteroid. And immediately after giving first dose of corticosteroid, you are going to go for induction of labor. You will not wait for 48 hours. You are not going to wait for 48 hours for corticosteroids to act. So, if your patient has high BPs, you know, severe preeclampsia and your question says there is fetal distress, abruptio, impending eclampsia, eclampsia, HELP syndrome or severe uncontrollable hypertension, then you just have to give a single shot of glucocorticoids and deliver your patient. As I told you, this HELP syndrome was earlier not included in this list, but in Williams' new edition, it has been included in this list. Now, but if your patient has severe preeclampsia and she is less than 34 weeks uh, pregnant but she has any of these four things which I am going to tell you PROM where P stands for preterm labor or premature rupture of membranes R stands for renal, uh, renal dysfunction or growth retardation O stands for oligohydramnios and M stands for umbilical artery doppler showing you a reversed end diastolic flow in these conditions you have to give the complete dose of corticosteroid. Right? So, you have to give a complete dose of corticosteroid. In other words, after first dose, you have to give wait for 48 hours after giving the first dose and then go for induction of labor. So, remember this PROM very important. You have to remember this PROM that if your question comes that there is a severe preeclampsia patient with preterm labor, premature rupture of membranes, renal dysfunction IUGR, oligohydramnios or an umbilical artery doppler, you are getting a reversed end diastolic flow. Then in that case, you are going to give first dose of corticosteroids. You are going to wait for 48 hours and then deliver the patient. If your patient is more than equal to 34 weeks in any case you have to deliver the patient irrespective of any other thing if patient is severe preeclampsia and more than equal to 34 weeks you have to deliver them immediately in case of help syndrome and in case of eclampsia as i told you you have to do immediate termination of pregnancy irrespective of gestational age irrespective of the gestational age just do immediate termination of pregnancy right patient is less than 34 weeks just give a single shot of corticosteroids and do induction of labor do not wait for 48 hours
right now the most common mode of delivery in case of pih is vaginal delivery and while you are doing vaginal delivery epidural analgesia is going to be given you are going to do catheterization in eclampsia patient you are going to cut short the second stage of labor by either prophylactic forceps or by vacuum and after delivery methyl ergometrin is contraindicated because methyl ergometrin increases the bp of the patient right the indications for cesarean section in case of preeclampsia are poor bishop score absent end diastolic flow and reversed end diastolic flow now the anesthesia which you give whenever you have a patient of pih is epidural anesthesia for absent end diastolic flow and reversed end diastolic flow general anesthesia may be used now coming to uh, the management of eclampsia now the first step for management of eclampsia is airway management that's a very important question and then you are going to give magnesium sulfate plus you are going to give anti hypertensive right and you are going to do immediate termination of pregnancy that is the complete management of eclampsia that the first step is you have to do airway management and you have to pull up the rail so that the patient doesn't fall and uh, along with that then you are going to give uh, magnesium sulfate using in prechard regime anti hypertensives and immediately you are going to do termination of pregnancy now according to prechard regime the loading dose which you have to give is without checking the renal functions and the im dose is 10 uh, grams per 50% solution iv dose is 4 grams 20% solution so total you have to give 14 grams maintenance dose which has to be given is has to be given after every 4 hour till 24 hours after uh, delivery or till 24 hours after the last convulsion whichever is later and the maintenance dose is im 5 grams 50% solution which has to be given on alternate buttock now when you were giving loading dose as i told you you are not going to do any checking you are not going to check the renal status and you are going to give the loading dose now the, in the loading dose the im dose was 10 grams and this 10 grams had to be given 5 grams in each buttock in case of magnesium the therapeutic range of magnesium is very low it is 4 to 7 milli equivalents per liter which means if magnesium is less than 4 then patient will continue throwing convulsions and if it is more than 7 in the blood then that leads to toxicity so before giving maintenance dose you have to check three things urine output which should be 100 ml in 4 hours deep tendon reflexes should be present and respiratory rate should be more than equal to 12 breaths per minute only if all these three are present then i am going to give the maintenance dose if any one of them is absent then i'm not going to give the maintenance dose if magnesium toxicity occurs then i have to give the antidote as calcium gluconate please remember that magnesium is centrally acting drug it is a centrally acting drug which is going to block the nmda receptors which is going to uh, block the release of acetylcholine from the nerve endings and it is going to do membrane stabilization because it blocks calcium channel it is all it also acts like a calcium channel blocker so it uh, stabilizes the membranes of the neurons right that is how magnesium sulfate acts now whenever there is magnesium sulfate toxicity the first sign of magnesium sulfate toxicity is that the knee jerk is lost and it is going to be lost when magnesium is more than equal to 10 milli equivalents per liter respiratory depression occurs at magnesium more than equal to 12 milli equivalents per liter respiratory paralysis occurs at 15 milli equivalents per liter and cardiac arrest occurs at 25 milli equivalents per liter right so that is how magnesium has to be given uh, then comes prevention of pih now for prevention of pih you have to give low dose aspirin that is 75 to 150 mg per day to all high risk pregnant females starting from 12 to 16 weeks and continuing up till 36 weeks now uh, acog recently has given and this is what is there in williams new edition also that what are the who are those high risk females in whom you have to give aspirin to prevent pih and this you can remember by the name of all hypertensive mothers can die where a stands for aplas syndrome hypertensive stands for or if there is previous history of preeclampsia or if there is history of chronic hypertension mothers stands for multifetal pregnancy k stands for kidney disease and di stands for diabetes so in these conditions in these 1 2 3 4 5 conditions you have to give low dose aspirin starting from 12 to 16 weeks of pregnancy and going up till 36 weeks of pregnancy now for predicting pih Uh, there are certain mar markers which are going to increase and certain markers which are going to decrease please remember pih is such an important topic that four questions in neat were asked directly from pih so what are the markers which increase during pregnancy which increase in a case of pih so they are serum endoglin serum sflt1 these are all anti angiogenic factors 
the anti angiogenic factors they increase in pih serum endoglin and serum flt1 flt1 is soluble uh, tyrosine kinase like molecule right so SFLT1 and endoglin increase during uh, in a case of PIH. Thromboxin A2 increases in a case of PIH. The ones which decrease are vascular endothelial growth factor, placental growth factor, and prostacyclin I2. Prostacyclin I2. These are the ones which decrease during PIH. So three markers which increase during PIH. All these three they should be on your tips: endoglin, SFLT1, and thromboxin A2. And the ones which decrease are vascular endothelial growth factor, placental growth factor, and prostacyclin I2. Then uterine artery Doppler which is done between 22 to 24 weeks and if it shows persistence of diastolic notch that is a predictor of PIH and these days the, you know it is also being done between 11 to 13 weeks and when it is done between 11 to 13 weeks it predicts early onset preeclampsia. Right, so uh, uterine uh, uh, uterine artery Doppler can predict PIH. Generally, the time for doing it is between 22 to 24 weeks. Where if you are seeing persistence of diastolic notch, that indicates PIH. If you can do it early between 11 to 13 weeks, and then also it in can indicate early onset preeclampsia. Certain important one-liners: PIH is a multi-organ defect. In PIH, there is incomplete trophoblastic invasion. The endovascular cytotrophoblast. This endovascular cytotrophoblast, which is is a part of the extravillous cytotrophoblast. It fails to replace the lining of the myometrial segment of the spiral arteries. So the spiral arteries have got two segments. One segment is the segment which is lying in the decidua and the one segment is lying in myometrium. So it is the endovascular cytotrophoblast which is a part of the extravillous cytotrophoblast. It fails to replace the lining of this myometrial segment and that is what leads to PIH. The most common Common organ affected is kidney. Histopathological feature which is seen when kidney is involved in PIH is glomeruloendotheliosis. PIH is more common in primary gravida female and for prognosis of PIH we do umbilical artery Doppler. Now, in umbilical artery Doppler, if SD ratio becomes more than 3, then that means you have to terminate pregnancy at 37 weeks. If you are getting an absent end diastolic flow, if you are getting absent end diastolic flow, then pregnancy has to be terminated between 32 to uh, 34 weeks, that's sorry, between 33 to 34 weeks. And if you are getting a reverse diastolic flow, then pregnancy has to be terminated between 30 to 30. Two weeks. So these are the new things which you have to remember. Earlier it was said that for absent end diastolic flow it is 34 weeks. Now it is 33 to 34 weeks. For reversed end diastolic flow it was said 32 weeks. Now it is 30 to 32 weeks. Clear to all of you? So that is what you have to remember about PIH. <laughs>